So in this video, I will explain through examples thermochemistry by including internal energy, heat transfer, and enthalpy, change in enthalpy. Here are a bunch of formulas that we are going to use in this video. According to the first law of thermodynamics, change in internal energy is sum of the heat and work, heat transfer and work done. Work itself is minus external pressure multiplied by change in volume. The way how we measure the change in internal energy is by using a bomb calorimeter, which operates in cost and volume. Heat transfer, you have to keep, you have to keep in mind that uh, heat always flows from the matter with higher temperature to the matter with low, lower temperature. You have to keep in mind also that the Q of the system is always minus Q of the surrounding. They always have the opposite effect. We will see through examples. And Q itself can be measured by using a specific heat capacity, mass of a matter and the change in the temperature. Specific heat capacity is the amount of heat required to rise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Here, this one is the heat capacity, which is the amount of heat required to rise one degree Celsius, the temperature of a certain amount of matter. In terms of enthalpy, we have the stoichiometry related to enthalpy. We are going to see coffee cup calorimeter is another calorimeter that operates in constant pressure, which is used to measure the enthalpy experimentally, especially in aqua solution. We are going to say has low to determine the enthalpy without measuring it experimentally, and we are going to use standard enthalpy formation to find the standard enthalpy change for a reaction. In thermochemistry, there are two critical components that we call system and surrounding. System and surrounding always interact with each other in the form of heat and in the form of work. Thermochemistry deals mostly with heat, heat transfer. You have to know also that the internal energy and change in enthalpy are state function, which means that they do not depend on the pathway that the system follows, but only on the initial and final stages. Let's move now to the first example. How much heat is required to warm 1.5 liter of water from 25 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, assuming the density 1 gram per milliliter? Here we have our data, and we are going to find the Q or the heat needed to warm the, wa warm the water. So we are going to use this formula. So Q is equal to mass of the water that we can find because we have density. Doesn't matter that is given in liter because we can convert. Specific heat capacity of water, which is this one here, and delta T that is changed on the temperature, initial and final temperature. So let's run the calculations. We see that the value is positive, which means that the process is endothermic and indeed is endothermic. We cannot heat water spontaneously. You need to give energy to the water to raise its temperature. Keep in mind here that is T2 minus T1 or T final minus T initial. Let's move now to an example that deals with heat transfer. A 30 gram cube of copper initially at 50 degrees Celsius is submerged in 100 gram of water at 25 degrees Celsius. What is the final temperature of both substances at thermal equilibrium? Assume that copper and water are thermally isolated from everything else. So if we draw something, it's going to be like this. So copper inside the water, submerged in water. The relation here is that Q of the system is equal to minus Q of the surrounding. But who is the system and who is the surrounding? The system is copper cube inside the water. The system is the water. So how does this translate? Q of copper is equal to minus Q of water. Water surrounding Q copper is the system. So we can expand this to So let's run some calculation to find the final temperature at the thermal equilibrium, which means that the temperature of copper and temperature of water are the same at thermal equilibrium.
we see a slightly increase due to the high amount and higher specific capacity of water. That's why we see a slight increase. So this is the final temperature at the thermal equilibrium. Let's move now to an example that deals with change in internal energy. We know that change in internal energy of a reaction is equal to Q plus W heat plus work. In order to measure the change in internal energy, we are going to use bomb calorimeter. Let's draw a scheme how it looks like. So this is how it looks like a bomb calorimeter. It works in the constant volume. This is a stirrer, a thermometer, a chamber here that happens the reaction mostly are used for combustion reactions. It has enough oxygens inside here to react with the sample. So we measure the heat that this chamber exchanged with the calorimeter. So delta H of the reaction in constant volume means that Q plus P delta V, which is the work, but in volume constant, this, is, this term is going to be zero. So delta E of the reaction in constant volume is going to be equal to the heat of the reaction at the constant volume. Let's illustrate this with an example. When two gram of sucrose undergo combustion in a bomb calorimeter, the temperature rises from 25 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. Find the change in the internal energy for the combustion of sucrose in kilojoule per mole. The heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter determined in a separate experiment is 5 kilojoule per grad Celsius. Here are the data given by the calorimeter. We have to find the change in the internal energy of the reaction. So, Q of the system is always minus Q of the surrounding. In our case, the system is our sample in the chamber that is going to be combusted. So that means that is Q of the reaction. And the surrounding is the calorimeter that is going to absorb the heat released by the combustion, by the combustion reaction. So minus Q of the calorimeter. And delta A of the reaction, which is required to be in kilojoule per mole, is Q of the reaction divided by moles of the sucrose that we have. So let's run some calculation. Keep in mind here that we cannot find directly the Q of the reaction, but we can find Q of the calorimeter with the given data because the temperature here are for the calorie change in temperature of the calorimeter. So what do we have? So from this simple equation, heat capacity of calorimeter that is given and change in the temperature of the calorimeter, we can find the heat absorbed by the calorimeter due to the reaction. This heat here is the heat that has a positive sign is taken by the reaction, which means that the heat of the reaction by this equation here is equal to minus 25 kilojoule. So this is the heat released by the, this combustion reaction. But this heat is not the internal energy in kilojoules per mole. This heat corresponds to two grams of sucrose burned in the chamber. So in order to find the heat released in kilojoule per mole, we are going to use this expression here. This is the molar mass, eh? this here. So the value is So the change in the internal energy of this combustion reaction is minus 4278.75 kilojoule per mole.
Let's move now to an example that deals with enthalpy. You have to know that enthalpy is equal to internal energy plus product of the pressure and volume. And volume. Enthalpy operates in constant pressure. So, change in enthalpy is equal to change in the internal energy plus pressure that is constant and change in the volume. But previously, at the beginning, we mentioned that work is equal to minus P delta V, which means that the minus work is plus P delta V. But the internal energy itself is Q, in this case, is and constant pressure plus work. So this here is equal to this one here which is minus work, is equal, these two are going to eliminate each other, to Qp, delta H. So, changing the enthalpy at the constant pressure is equal to the heat that evolves from the reaction. At this point, at everybody's head, comes an interesting question. When a chemical system undergoes a change in enthalpy, where does the energy come from and go to? The simplest answer to this question is that chemical energy is sort of potential energy which means during a reaction, some bonds break and new ones form, and the nuclei and electrons reorganize into an arrangement with lower potential energy in the case of exothermic reaction, and the difference in potential energy is released as a heat, or the opposite in endothermic reaction, where we give heat thermal energy to the system, and the products are at higher potential energy. A side note here is that to break bond, we need to spend energy to the system. When bonds are formed, new bonds, the system releases energy to the surrounding. Let's move first to an example that involves stoichiometry in the change in enthalpy, also called thermochemical equation. You have to know that the value of delta H of the reaction reflects stoichiometric amount of reactant and product in a reaction as written. So, for example, Calculate the heat in kilojoule associated with a complete combustion of 10 kg of propane. So first we have to write and balance the chemical equation. We have given the mass of the propane, which is in kilogram. We can convert it in mass in gram. After that, we can find the number of moles of the propane by using its molar mass. And after that, we can find the kilojoules released by this combustion reaction. So let's run the calculations. At this simple example, you have to keep in mind this one here, this conversion factor here that is new, because this reflects the stoichiometry of the reaction, because this is 1 here. So if this one, number here was another number, let's say 2, this one should have been 2. So the change in enthalpy depends directly to the coefficients in the balanced equation. For example, if we were using oxygen in the calculation should have been this amount of change in enthalpy divided by 5 moles of oxygen. Let's move now to the constant pressure calorimeter, which we use it to measure the change in enthalpy of reaction experimentally. How does it look like? This also is called coffee cup calorimeter. It is like a coffee cup, uh, isolated with styrofoam, normally. It has a stirrer and a thermometer, and the reaction happened in the solution here. So I tried to make one by myself, it looks like this, but it doesn't work, it's, as you can guess, a coffee cup, not a calorimeter, but it looks like that. So, coffee cup calorimeters are used to measure the change in enthalpy, because they operate at constant pressure, at atmospheric pressure, in other words. In this case, again, Q 
of the system is equal to q of the surrounding. q of the system is a reaction, q of the reaction, and the q of the surrounding is q of the solution. Because the reaction happens in the solution, so we cannot find directly the q of the reaction, but we can find the q of the solution with a theta given here. So q of the solution is equal mass of the solution multiplied by specific heat capacity of the solution multiplied by change in the temperature of the solution. So let's run the calculations. Here we have to convert milliliters in grams by using the density that is given. So the heat absorbed by the solution is plus 3000 joules or 3 kilojoules, which means that the heat released by the reaction is minus 3000 joules. In order to find the delta H for this reaction, we have to find the delta H that correspond to one mole. So delta H of the reaction is equal Q of the reaction divided by moles of the magnesium in this case which serves as a limiting reactant in this exercise. We have enough and more solution to react all this magnesium that we add in the calorimeter. So is equal minus three kilojoule. We are converting this to kilojoule. One kilojoule is equal to 1000 joule. Divided by 0 0.158 gram magnesium multiplied by its conversion factor generated by the molar mass. One mole of magnesium so the reaction is exothermic. So from now we have seen that with bomb calorimeter we operate in constant volume and we measure the change in the internal energy. With coffee cup calorimeter which operates in constant pressure we measure the change in the enthalpy of a reaction. Let's move now to the Hess law, a German scientist. Hess was a genius. He said that if a chemical equation can be expressed as a sum of a series of steps, then change in the enthalpy for the overall equation is the sum of the changes in enthalpy of the reaction for each step. Let's make it clear by an example. The idea of Hess law is that there are some equations that are difficult to measure enthalpy directly. But if we can find a way through several steps that can send us to the final equation by doing some mathematical calculation and by using the steps that we know the delta H for that kind of reaction, we can find the change in enthalpy of our desired equation, which means by summing up all the other enthalpies in each step. So to solve this kind of problem, me personally, I prefer the method that we start from the final equation that we need. In previous example, we said that enthalpy is directly related with the stoichiometry coefficients in the equations. So we have one carbon here that is as a reactant. We have one carbon here that is a, as a reactant, one, one, there is no change there. We can write the first equation as it is. Now let's move to water. Water in the final equation is as a reactant, but if you look at the steps here above, we see that water is, a, is at the product. In order to bring water to the reactant, we have to reverse this equation. And also this is one water here and here we have two waters. So we have to divide that by two or multiply by one over two which means that we can multiply that mon minus 1 over 2 minus represent the fact that we have to reverse the reaction. Also, if you reverse the reaction, you are going to change the sign of enthalpy here. In this case, it's going to be positive. But also, if you multiply by a number here, also the enthalpy is going to be applied by that number. Let's move now to carbon oxide. We see that the carbon oxide at our desired equation is products. So we have here at the reactants. So again, we have to multiply 
by minus 1, 1 over 2 to reverse the, to reverse the equation and also to eliminate these two because we have 1 here. Again, the same thing is going to happen to end LP. It's going to change the sign. And let's rewrite it. From here, we can see that what we are going to simplify, we are going to simplify one oxygen here with half oxygens here. We write half oxygens here because we are dealing with moles. We are not dealing with atoms. We are not separating atoms. That's why we have the right to write this. Uh, CO2, CO2 is simplified, and what is left? Carbon plus water gives hydrogen plus CO. And the delta H of the reaction is going to be delta H1 plus delta H2 plus delta H3. And if we do the calculation, delta H for the reaction is going to be plus 131.3 kilojoule. So it's going to be positive and the process is endothermic. Now let's take a look at the third way how we can determine the enthalpy of a reaction by using the standard enthalpy of formation. Before we go to an example to illustrate this method, let's take a look at the standard state condition, which are temperature is going to be 298.15 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius pressure 1 atmosphere and uh, concentration of resolution 1 molar. These are the standard state. By using this standard state for all the reactant and the products, we can find the change in enthalpy in the standard state for a reaction. So let's move now to the standard enthalpy of formation, which is right at delta H degree F. For a pure element is in its standard state is equal to zero. For a compound, the standard enthalpy of formation is the change in enthalpy when one mole of a compound formed from its constituent element in their standard state. By looking at the tables at the end of the books, we can find standard enthalpy of formation for many compounds. So by using them, we can find the standard enthalpy change of a reaction by using this formula. So change in standard enthalpy is equal to sum of the enthalpy of formation of the product minus sum of enthalpy of formation of reactant. This is the stoichiometrical coefficient in the reactions for the products and for the reactant. So let's take a look at one example how we are going to use this formula. This here on the side are the data taken from the books and as you can see delta H of the formation of the elements is zero. Delta H of formation of the compounds is different from zero, it's a value. These are the products, these are the reactants. So what do we have? Product minus reactant. Delta H of formation of nitrogen is zero. Delta H of formation of water is minus 241 kilojoule per mole. But keep in mind you have to multiply it by four, which is the coefficient in the balanced equation. Minus delta H of the formation of N2O4 is plus 95.4 kilojoule per mole. No multiplication, no multiplication here because it's just one. And uh, plus 4 multiplied by 0 for the hydrogen which is in standard state. So it's 0, delta H of the formation. Standard enthalpy change of the reaction is going to be minus 1062 kilojoule per mole this value that we need here. So this is the third way to determine the enthalpy of a reaction. But in this case, we have to work only in their standard state. The final thing that I want to touch is heat of the fusion and heat of vaporization. Heat of the fusion is associated with the melting of ice, for example. Heat of vaporization is associated with vaporization of water. So in this case, there are some, there are two simple formulas is mass of the ice, for example, multiplied by enthalpy of the fusion, change in enthalpy of the fusion, or number of moles multiplied by change in enthalpy of the fusion. Depends how they give you this. If they give this joule per gram, you're going to use mass. If they give this joule per mole, 
you're going to use number of moles. If you do not have, you're going to find number of moles in the exercise. And the heat of, ev of vaporization is mass again, but here is multiplied by del change in enthalpy of vaporization or number of mole by change in enthalpy of vaporization. What does these two concepts mean? Take a look at this simple graph. We have, for example, a piece of ice at minus 10 degrees Celsius. It's going to increase its temperature up until zero degrees Celsius. At this point, it's going to need some heat to break the crystalline structure, which is called heat of the fusion. And after that, it is going to be converted to water and the water is going from zero to 100 degrees Celsius. And at this point, we have again a step that is called heat of vaporization. That is the energy that we need to vaporize the water and to convert it to steam. So we have Q1 to increase the temperature. That is the simplest formula that we learned. M multiplied by specific heat capacity multiplied by changing the temperature. Here is Q heat of the fusion and here is heat of the vaporization. So we have to keep in mind these two concepts because when we want to find the heat total for this system is going to be here Q1, Q2, Q3 plus Q4. Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4. For Q1 and uh, Q3 and Q5 in steam plus Q5. And Q5 we are going to use the simplest formula that was Q mass multiplied by specific heat capacity multiplied by change in the temperature. But with Q2, this one here, and Q4, this one here, you do not have any change in the temperature. That's why you measure the heat required in the case of ice to melt it and in the case of boiled water to evaporate it. So that's why we, you use these two formulas. Okay. Thanks for watching guys, see you in the next video, hope you find this video helpful, give it a thumbs up and see you in the next one, peace.